Welcome back inside the No Morning Show, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you make out the song in the background, but the song is Ease the Tension by the Mighty Shadow. And this morning we want to ease some tension and we're going to find out uh, Tobago side of things, Tobago's perspective, uh, at least the Chief Secretary's perspective. Good morning, Mr. Ansel Dennis. Good morning to you, sir, and good morning to, of course, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, those uh, taking in this goes across the globe as well because I, I expect that we are live on social media platforms yes we are definitely oh, live yeah. on facebook as well so good morning to everybody who's locked on on facebook as well now we're talking tobago autonomy bills this morning um have you been paying attention to what's going on in the parliament sir of course i i was actually in the parliament in the flesh on mm -hmm. monday from about 10 a.m and then tuesday from about 12 noon and therefore, I was able to observe carefully what took place in the parliament. And in some cases, it was quite unfortunate, not only to the people of Tobago, but to the people of this country. Why you say it's unfortunate? What's unfortunate? Well, we first must understand the, the history of Tobago's autonomy. And I will not go too far back, but I will simply start from the year 2013 was the year that I was first elected as an assemblyman uh, in the Tobago House of Assembly at the age of 26. So I am actually aware of what transpired from that period to now. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was Pochoy Charles who went to the then Chief Secretary over London. And he said to Mr. London, look, now is a good time for us to unite as political parties in Tobago. And use this united approach to ensure that we get Tobago's autonomy. As a matter of fact, he said jokingly, let's get together and, and fight together for what Tobago wants. And then when we get what we want, we could fight each other to see who will manage it. <laughs> and yeah. of course, in that period, there were consultations, approximately 40 meetings across communities in Tobago and also in Trinidad. Um, there were a number of conventions as well, attended by hundreds of Tobagoans, and therefore a lot of consultations went into these efforts. And, mm -hmm. and it culminated in 2016 when the Tobago House of Assembly, just before the, the 2017 THA election, debated and approved those bills. And of course, from there it went to the cabinet led by the uh, People's National Movement, Tobago born Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. And from there, the process with the Joint Select Committee started in March of 2018. And there I was in the parliament, hearing opposition members of parliament making the foolish and bogus argument that there were not sufficient consultations, right? In addition to the bogus arguments, I could have detected that they simply were not prepared to debate Tobago's people's business. Why right? do you say that? Why do you say that, Mr. Dennis, that they weren't prepared so, so, to debate so, so, Tobago's business? So based on the quality of the contributions, I'm not sure if anybody really sat and listened to what was coming out of the parliament, but UNC MP after UNC MP, they tried to milk that argument of a lack of consultations or insufficient consultations I heard not one proposal put forward to improve the bill. They seem to be relying on this excuse that look, Tobago people need more time to discuss this issue. And every speaker, as a matter of fact, the speaker of the house at one point, right, literally banned the speakers from, from discussing a lack of consultation because it became extremely repetitive. repetitive. Right? Mm -hmm. And of course, they milked that excuse um, to the point of sounding ridiculous and unprepared. They advanced no suggestions to improve the bill. A lot of them were not even aware of the names of some of the representatives in the Tobago House of Assembly. A lot of them showed scant courtesy and a lack of concern for the business of the people of Tobago. And I think it was a sad day in the parliament on Tuesday. And to add insult to injury, Right? At one point in time in, in, in the parliament, 
when the speaker looked to the opposition members to make a contribution, none of them in the house were prepared to speak. As a matter of fact, the leader of the opposition, and I want the people to be able to know this, the leader of the opposition, who this country pays a salary to, to, to represent the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, on the first day, she showed up late, I was right there, she spent roughly 20 minutes in the parliament. On Tuesday, I got there around lunchtime. I'm not sure if she was in the parliament before, but when I got there, she was not there. At one point, she came into the parliament briefly and left again, right? But lo and behold, you know what her major contribution to this debate was? To come into the parliament, at some point in time, wherever she came from, whether it was the bar or the tea room or wherever she came from, right? To literally lead our walkout of the opposition members of parliament. Having not contributed anything to the bill, she did not show up to speak. Even if she wanted to contribute, she was not in the parliament at the point in time and therefore the speaker had no choice but to look to the government bench for somebody to get up and contribute. And that person, of course, the final contributor was Dr. Rowley, who took the decision to wrap up the debate at that point in time. So you know what, Mr. Nothing. You know what, Mr. Dennis? I think that, you know, even from the people who were chosen from the UNC's bench to speak, to me, that in itself sent a message because Kamala Prasad Bissessa, in her defense, was saying only six people are allowed in the chamber. But my question, even yesterday to Geraldine John, why wasn't she one of the six? As uh, Camille Robinson Regis pointed out, she wasn't there. Saddam Hussein wasn't there. Dr. Munilal wasn't there. And there are three of the strongest speakers on the United National Congress's side. And but none they of had them spoke. a responsibility to manage the flow of things in the House, right? And I'm saying if you know you're allowed only six persons, then ensure that one of the six in the House at any particular time is in a position to speak and contribute to the motion. Because, of course, according to parliamentary procedures, it's whoever catches the eye of the speaker will be allowed to speak. And if the, the, the speaker looks to the opposition benches and there was no one there to speak, then the debate has to continue. So I, I, I am calling it delinquency, right? And they are clearly not serious. I mean, I've heard a lot about them and, and how they operate in the parliament, but I was there to see for myself where the leader of the opposition, who this country is paying to manage or handle our business in a particular way, did not even bother to spend an hour in total, out of a total of 16 hours of debate in the parliament on Monday and Tuesday, discussing an issue not only important to the people of Tobago, but to the people of this country. So I but think Mr. that Dennis, was disrespectful, it was delinquent, and quite dangerous for this country at this point in time. Mr. Dennis, let us talk about the sticking points for Tobagonians, not the opposition, because the opposition probably was just using some of the arguments coming out of the Tobago to defend its, its not wanting to support Tobago autonomy. Some of the sticking points, and Ho Choi Charles raised them. And as somebody who was there, who was part of the consultation, who said that the consultation was good and they should work with what was proposed in the 2016 consultations, that there were 11 sticking points according to him. And I can think of some of them from what I watched in the Joint Select Committee. The definition for Tobago, its ability to make legislation that didn't have to be approved by the Parliament of Trinidad. The 11 nautical administrative miles. Mm -hmm. Those are three of the things that I think of immediately that comes to mind. Aren't these things, why, why was the House of Assembly prepared to accept the bill when those who are part of the consultations were saying no, these are things that needed fixing or changing. How many votes who Troy Charles got in the last general election? The answer to that question is 80 votes, right? And, and therefore it was quite unfortunate that the UNC chose to rely on simply the voice and the, the wishes and the aspirations, because I'm going to call it exactly that, aspirations of people like Ho Choi Charles, Winford James, Banners James, Farley Augustin, Watson Duke. What happened to the voice of the Chief Secretary, the duly installed Chief Secretary at this point in time? 
What happened to the voices of the six assemblymen on the on the PNM side? What happened to the voices of Shamfa Kojo and Ayana Websteroy, duly elected to represent the people of Tobago? Right. So are there you saying no that people of Tobago wanted the bill? Of course, definitely. And and maybe, you know, I, I can't remember if you were on or off air when we spoke about the possibility of persons from Tobago coming to shout down for the Spain or the Parliament. Mm -hmm. The bill. Maybe that is what is required, right? Because they are there in the parliament in the ignorance, making the foolish conclusion that the majority of Tobago um, doesn't want the bill. Who told them so? Who Choi Charles? Fanny um, Augustine? But Mr. Dennis, right? are we going to are we going to deny that? I mean, at the at the point in time we have the six six tie in Tobago, which means that that there's a portion of Tobagonians that do. Um, want Farley Augustine and the PDP to represent their interests, right? So we can say safely that as, as let me say half the island because it's half and half, right? In terms of how many seats. Mm -hmm. So then there must be some validity in what they are saying in terms of some of the challenges that people have brought to them regarding Agreed. the bill. I am saying that after all the huffing and puffing of Choi Charles and Farley Augustine, you know what it came down to? I don't know if you all saw this document. But well, this, is back we can't really see it properly. this is the communique that they sent to members of parliament. It came down to six issues. Mm -hmm. Six issues were highlighted in this document. So after all the charade and all the bacchanal that people don't want the bill and Tobagoonians must reject the bill and the bill is bad for Tobago, they came down to six issues. But who determined what? those six issues? What? Was it the THA or was it the 6-6 six, six on no, both no, no. sides? These six, this document was signed by Uchoi Charles and Farley Augustine. I don't know if they got together. I don't know if they, it, it included views of other Tobagonians. I don't know what was their process, right? They were on Channel 5. I think it was the Sunday um, at 2 p.m. Sunday before the, the parliamentary debate. And they had a feeling misleading to Begonians, misrepresenting the facts, blatantly lying. And on, on some occasions, I heard Farley Augustine say that the, the bill that the UNC bought in 2013, right, proposed 8%, right, for the Tobago House of Assembly. I'm not sure which bill he read. But when I read that UNC bill that came in 2013, that bill that lapsed in the parliament, and I want to read it, right? It says in section 10 of that bill, the amount appropriated for the purpose, the purposes of the Tobago House of Assembly in respect of any financial year shall be a minimum of 6.9% in the range of 6.9% to 8% of the total sum appropriated by parliament. But yeah, he, sees, he was there saying that the Kamla bill proposed 8% as a minimum, and therefore it's better than what the PNM government is proposing at this point in time. When in fact, according to the bill that was debated in the parliament, the minimum was 6.8%, and there was no maximum. So it could have been the maximum at any point in time could have been 8%, it could have been 9%, 12%, 13%, whatever can be determined by the, the, the Fiscal Review Commission once a strong case can be made. So it was quite unfortunate, and I'm going to speak more about that in a press conference this afternoon at 2 p.m. It was quite unfortunate that at this late stage, for, for reasons unknown to me, as a matter of fact, I know some of the reasons they decided to derail this process. Now, I am but not saying that the they bill... want secession. Do you think that it comes down to them wanting to secession? Because oh. based on the sticking points that I heard, even when it comes down to the legislature, the reality is that unless you're in a unitary state, the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago must have oversight. And if they're saying no to that, is it that you secession. think they want secession? Secession is the policy position of the progressive democratic features, right? Watson Duke is on record calling for secession, right? A PDP assemblyman is also on public record calling for secession. Secession has been the language, the things that they are seeking to, to, to bring to the table, 
are in fact secessionist and separatist views. Even when we talk about this issue of Tobago having its own exclusive economic zone and, and maritime boundary, right? That is in fact secessionist in nature. And of course, comparisons are being made to Scotland, but Scotland is a country by itself. Scotland is a constituent country as, as, as part of the United Kingdom. Scotland has its own flag, its own national anthem, and therefore they have their own exclusive economic zone on the basis that they are a separate country. We in Tobago are not asking for Tobago to be a separate country, whether independent of this union or as a constituent country. We are simply asking that in the bigger scheme of the unitary state of Trinidad and Tobago, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, for the people of Tobago to have more control over our internal affairs, right? And, and, and therefore, Tobago is not asking for secession. But secession, I must say, is the policy of the PDP. What's in Duke is on public record saying this. All right. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. I heard him say that, you know, you don't know what I'm saying. We want everything. And what we want is secession. And I can't remember the assemblyman who said it and then said, whoever told you that the people of Tobago wanted secession? It was, he changed it was, his... Ian, it was Ian Pollard, the, yeah, the assemblyman. Mr. Pollard. He changed his, yeah, he changed his mind very quickly. Providence may snow Moriah. Right. But so what is going to happen now? Because the bill obviously has lapsed. So when well, will the well, people well, of Tobago see uh, any kind of revival of this? Can it happen and when? Right. Um, based on my information, the bill has not lapsed, at least at this point. It is in committee stage, and that is where it is for this uh, period. Now, yeah, but based on the rules, when can it be brought back to the parliament? Right, I don't have all the details on the parliamentary rules, but I know the parliament goes on a break. Um, of course, according to the rules of the parliament, once an issue has been debated in a particular uh, session, it, it, it cannot be revived unless maybe there is some alteration to the or adjustment to the standing orders. Um, but the reality is that Tobago has missed a golden opportunity to go further. And therefore, it, it pains me and, and it's difficult for me to understand how come in a situation where we are operating currently with the much more inferior Act 40 of 1996, that persons, Tobago voices who at least the opposition consider to be credible, right? Persons who were part of this united process. Now I could understand people like, like, like Farley and they derailing the process because they simply did not understand where it came from. They simply were not part of those discussions and understood the work and the sacrifice and all of that that went into it. Yeah, but they're representing the voices. They're representing, Mr. Dennis, you're representing the voices of half of Tobago. You can't just say it's Farley and, and they, Watson Duke is that they're representing the people who and voted I'm, for them, which is almost half of Tobago. And I'm saying... And those Tobagonians may I'm have been saying, a part of the process. And I'm saying some people who are elected by the people do not always speak for their people, right? And I'm saying that without fear of contradiction. I am sure those UNC MPs in the parliament on Monday and Tuesday talking all kinds of dotishness were not necessarily speaking for their people. I am sure in many instances, they did not even have one ounce of consultation, right, with their own people. So I'm not going to necessarily agree that these people who spoke against this process and effectively derailed it and gave the UNC an excuse, right, because that is, that is, that's exactly what it was. They hung on to that excuse from the beginning of the debate all I heard was lack of consultations, lack of consultation, not one argument as to how we could improve the bill, what are the areas that should be excluded, what are the areas that should be ex yeah. included, not one sensible argument. All so I Mr. heard Dennis, was Mr. Dennis, do you, do, you still have, do you still have any hope at all for the bill? For this particular bill, yes. 
Okay. Um, I am going to make, and, and maybe I should make it even now, right? I am going to appeal to all those dissenting voices, right? Especially due to the fact that with all the dissent and with all the British talk, they came down to only six issues, right? Mm -hmm. The majority of these issues are already provided for in the bill. So I'm saying if this document represents all the issues that they have with this bill, then let's get back to the table and see if we can support this bill as one Tobago voice, as we have been doing since 2013 when we started this process. Because we understood, look, if we go down there in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago as a divided people, then we are likely to get ignored. And it was on that basis that Ochoi Charles and Ove in London got together and decided that, look, let's approach this thing from a unified perspective. And, if and yet you all went down as a divided people. And that is what I'm saying. That is, on quite, that is quite unfortunate. So if these are the six issues, I am calling for those dissenting voices to simply support the bill in its current form. Right? Let's we'll come back to the table to the, and fix the six, right? Well, support the bill in its current form. And there is something in the parliament called the committee stage, right? And, and that is exactly the stage the bill is at because the debate is completed and it's now at the committee stage where members of parliament could make suggestions and advance amendments and, and, and okay. suggest ways in which the bill can be improved. And of course, that will be an opportunity for the parliament to look at these issues. But I'm saying that can only happen. The UNC, I believe, will only take us seriously, right? If in fact, we remove the opportunity for them to make excuses about lack of consultations and persons in Tobago not being supportive of the bill and, and those kind of things. The bill Mr. is Dennis. not perfect, but it gives Tobago an opportunity to advance, an opportunity which we have never had before in the history of any Tobago House of Assembly. All right. Mr. Mr. Dennis, Mr. Dennis, we do have to leave it yeah. there. But I want to thank you very much for joining us, Ansel Dennis, the Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, and sharing your, your thoughts, your opinions on the Tobago Autonomy Bill and what's been going on. We'll take that quick break and come back with more inside the Now Morning Show. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Come on. Good day to you all.